In Farsi we say سگ زرد برادر شغاله which means the yellow dog is the brother of the jackal. The Yellow Dogs, an indie rock band from Tehran, recently moved to Brooklyn to do what they couldn't do back home, rock and roll. We just wanted to play music, and in that country we couldn't play music. We tried that for three and a half years. We couldn't get the permission uh, to uh, play public concerts, to release album. Before leaving, the band acted in an independent film that was shot without the government's permission. The movie, No One Knows About Persian Cats, shows Tehran's thriving underground rock music scene. We just yeah. wanted to live the style of living that we love to. I'm not going to censor myself for uh, the ideologies of another guy. Ram, who declined to give his last name, sings in another Iranian rock band, Hypernova. He and his bandmates took extra precautions when they played in Tehran. I always have lookouts um, during our shows. They would call us to watch out if the police are coming, and we'd have actually a, a big stash of money ready too, just in case the police raid the place so we could bribe them, because that's like a normal sort of thing in Iran, you, you know. Everything that Iranian rockers do has to be taken underground. It has to be against the law. We, we had to improvise and, and, and play in, in random places, like parking lots or villas outside the city. Today they practice in Williamsburg, a far cry from their secret rehearsal room on their Dromasina's rooftop. We used to call that the place that we had on his rooftop, a rehearsal room, Sagduni, which means dog house. <laughs> They soundproof the whole thing from the stuff that they found in the streets, like uh, foams and like uh, eggshells. But in reality, it wasn't very discreet. Actually, the sound, you know, it wasn't soundproofing. You could hear us in the streets. And the neighborhood was somehow a traditional neighborhood. Yeah. But, you know, we, communicate with, well, we communicated with the people and we became friends with them. Police often show up when someone phones in a noise complaint. So Sina's father had a backup plan. When our music was too loud, uh, his father used to turn the lights off. Something's there's, happening. There's something it, it happening. means something happening. And so when he turned the lights off, the sound will go off too. And for those who get caught, the consequences are very real. There were two bands in Iran that they threw a concert. It was like an open air concert and six 600 people there and the cops came inside and they arrest 200 people and the bandmates and the band members were in the jail for like for 21 days. But the threat of arrest wasn't enough to deter the yellow dogs. And we threw some underground concerts in Tehran, two underground concerts with lights and dance floor and everything. And the atmosphere at those times are really crazy. I've never seen such an atmosphere, even in New York. Sam Nurian grew up in Tehran. He attended house parties and remembers the underlying sense of danger. When you have a loud music, when girls and boy, boys are dancing, drinking, maybe smoking, that's absolutely forbidden. So if you want to have such a party like that, obviously you, you're going you're gonna to do it in a, in a way that, that, that would not be visible to the government. But to some young Iranians, the rewards outweigh the risks. They just want to find a place so they could go and have fun, let me tell you. You can't drink alcohol because it's forbidden, so that's the place. You go there, you dance, and you drink. I mean, that's what you do in America, isn't it? You go to the club, you drink, if you're in the mood, you dance too. They've left Iran behind, but the struggle isn't over. How's a band from Tehran supposed to crack the American top 40? David Haydu, an author and music critic, talked about the uneasy relationship between popular music and Middle Eastern culture. 
American pop musicians have tended on the whole to treat the Middle East as a source of exotica. By 1961, Ray Stevens comes along and composes the song that is surely the biggest hit ever in the American pop charts to deal in any way with Middle Eastern culture. It's called, uh, and I don't even want to say this, called uh, Ahab the Arab. Let me tell you about Ahab the Arab, the sheik of the burning sand. They had emeralds and rubies just dripping off of him, had a ring on every finger of his hand. He wore a big old turban wrapped around his head, scimitar by his side. The decades that followed were no kinder. The 70s gave us Steve Martin's King Tut. The 80s... Like Egyptian. <laughs> you know, it's 2010, but that's the tradition of American popular music. And that kind of thinking still frames the way that the pop music business thinks about the Middle East. Perhaps this is the time now for uh, acceptance of uh, the Middle Eastern sensibility in popular music. Navigating the music business is just one of many changes that the band is going through. We miss our families, I miss my girlfriend, my family, my car, everything. We just left behind so many things. Though no one knows about Persian cats, the yellow dogs just might be the right people to tell us all about them. They're people with one foot in one world, the world of childhood, one foot in the world of adulthood. And they're struggling to reconcile these different worlds. So to the degree that the band represents a, a kind of struggle, kind of pull between two worlds as well, it has something in common with the pop music audience.